How many like liver and onions? I do too. Now, I, I like my liver thin. I like it well done. I don't like it red in the middle and all that type. But hey, I was raised on cow tongue. I've, I can still see it. It wasn't sliced. It just lay up there on the table, <laughs> in the middle of the table. And uh, mom cut a slice and give it to you, and the top of it was like sandpaper. I mean, it was the whole tongue. I can see that big old tongue laying out there. Uh, I'm glad she, we didn't have buffalo tongue. We'd, we'd had too many leftovers. But liver and onions. They, yeah, yes, yeah, sir, brother. Hey, I'll tell you what. We used to eat everything but squeal on the pig. All right, Leviticus 27. Going to try to cover this chapter very quickly this morning. Uh, reason being, it 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 was of tremendous use to those in in the Old Testament. It has to do with now people who made a vow unto God. Uh, we got a lot of things where they where they estimated the worth of everything. And the reason being, let me just read a couple of verses. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When a man make a singular vow. This is something specific. All right? You ever vow to God? You know, the Bible says it's better not to make a vow than to vow and not keep it. Uh, a lot of people today, they make vows, but they, they don't keep the vows. They do for a little while. And, you know, uh, it, you got the New Year's resolution thing going on, and that's okay. I think we ought to resolve uh, to try to make our life better and make it different. I'm not against New Year's resolutions, uh, but normally they're only good for New Year's Day. And then after that, it's over. Vows were not the same with the Lord. When you made a vow to God, God said it's better you not make a vow than to make a vow and not keep that vow. So we get into vows. He's talking about a singular vow. Now, what he's going to do is look at the last ver part of the verse 2. The persons, plural. A man make, but now the persons, plural. Why? He's going to apply this not just to men, but he's going to apply this to a lot of different things. Uh, ladies make vows. Sometime a lady will make a vow unto the Lord. Lord, I'm going to do this. And, and by the way, that's not fleecing. It's not, Lord, if you'll do this, I'll do this. All right. Making a vow is uh, not worried about the consequences. You just say, Lord, I'm going to do this for you. And, I, and, and you give that to the Lord. So he's talking about a man. Then he's talking about persons in plural by their estimation. Now, we're just going to walk down through these. What he did, the vow always cost them something. A lot of people like to make a vow, but it never cost them. You know, vows cost you something. Wedding vows cost you something. When you make a vow, it's going to cost you something for uh, better or worse, richer, poor, sickness, health. You know, you're going down through there. There's an expense uh, to things, and vows need to have expenses to them, and that's what this is. He said, when you make a vow, you're going to make an offering as soon as you make that vow. Now, he's going to estimate how much they give. Verse number 3, the estimation shall be of a male from 20 years old even to 60. You're talking about a, a working class man. Men did not go to war until they were 20 years old in the Bible. They didn't let 18 and 19 year olds get out on the field. You know, they tell them they can't buy guns, they can't do this, they can't do that. And then they'll stick a... Uh, uh, M1 and A1 in their hand and put them on the battlefield someplace. They, they can't buy a weapon in the United States, but they can die on the battlefield. Wasn't that way. 20 years old and upward, from 20 to 60 was the working age. We've sort of kind of got that now. You can retire. Uh, it was 62, and then it's gone to 63 if you want to retire early, and then it's 67. I don't know what it is. I'm so far beyond, I forgot what retirement age is. But what they did was, they gave an estimation. Now, if you're a 20 to 60 year old male, thy estimation, notice in verse 3, is 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. 
The shekel was a coin. It was a silver coin that they had that they, that, that I, I'm not even sure what the American worth was. But if a man made a vow, he had to give 50 shekels. Look in verse 2. But if it be a female, then thy estimation shall be 30 shekels. Why the difference from 20 to 60? Why the difference between them? Because the ladies guided the homes, but the men actually did the work in the sanctuaries and things of that. And ladies didn't draw the money like the men did because the men brought home the living basically and, and took care of things at the house. So hers was 30. The interesting thing about this, they sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of a woman, not a man. They should have estimated his worth at 50 and given to Judas's carrot 50 pieces of silver. They gave 30 the price of the woman. Why? He was buying a bride. When he died on that cross, he was buying a bride. Boy, you're talking about the accuracy of your Bible. Your Bible is dead on. So the woman was 30 shekels. Now, verse 5, if they are between 5 and 20 years old, you're talking about a child up through puberty and coming into adulthood. Uh, Sometimes, you know, kids, they grow bodies before they grow brains. I, 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 that's just one of the things of growing up. They, they do that quite often. So if it's a young person, the male was 20 shekels and the female was 10. In verse number 6, if it be a month old to five then thy estimation shall be the male five shekels of silver, and for the female thy estimation shall be three shekels of silver. Verse number seven, if it be from 60 years old and above, if it be a male, then you're worth 15 cents. All right. Boy, they dropped that real quick, didn't they? Uh, you're over 60, you're just worth 15 shekels, gentlemen, instead of 50 shekels. You say, why? Well, you don't do as much as you did. You're not worth as much, and you don't have as much time left to do what you're going to do with that vow. So he said that the man, it drops down to 15 shekels, but look at the, with the female in verse number 5, it drops to 10, from 30 to 10. So he's, he's, God's figuring a lot of things in here. One, how much they can do for God, how long they can do something for God. These are figured in. We're going to find out in a little while. He goes back to the year of Jubilee in some of these areas when he's doing that. Verse number six, month old to five years, five shekels silver, three for the girls. Sixty and above, 15 shekels, 10 for the ladies. Verse number 8, but if he be poorer than thy estimation. When you go to this priest, say uh, he's uh, a man that should be full strength and everything else, and his estimation 50 shekels, but he financially cannot put 50 shekels in. He, he does not have that. You know, you got some people that are a little more affluent financially than others, and and things of this nature. So what God did in here, it regardless of what your financial status was or anything else, God made it where everybody could make a vow and then pay an estimation for that vow. So he said if he'd be poor, he shall present himself before the priest. The priest is now going to put a value on him. He is the tax assessor, all right? He puts a value on you. You know, most of the time they value tax-wise your house less than it is actually worth. Thank God for that. And when you get to be 65 years old, you can get this Homestead Act, this Homestead, uh, which we've done, cuts your taxes in half. I mean, drops them down. So when you get 65, go to the courthouse, get a... A uh, homestead exemption, and it will drop your taxes tremendously when you do that. So the priest will value him according to his ability that he vowed shall the priest value him. Now, verse number 9, he's not going to bring shackles, he's going to bring a beast. What's well, sheep, lamb, goat, uh, cattle. You're going to bring something that you possess is what he's doing. 
He said in verse number 9, If it be a beast whereof men bring an offering unto the Lord, all that any man giveth of such unto the Lord shall be holy. Now, once you give that to the Lord, he says, All right, what I want you to do, I want you to bring one lamb. You remember, Mary brought two turtle doves. They couldn't, they were so poor, they couldn't, they didn't have a lamb, her and Joseph. They were poor. He was a carpenter, so when for her cleansing, she brought the lesser, which was two turtle dove, and that's what she brought. Now, when you bring, whatever you give God now, at that point in time, it's holy. In other words, you don't give it to God and take it back. You give that thing to God, it's His. At that point in time, regardless of what it is, verse number 10, He shall not alter it nor change it, a good for a bad or a bad for a good. He say, oh, wait a minute. I, I, I gave you my best lamb. I want to bring one. I've got one that's got three legs and one ear. All right. I want to bring you one that's not quite as good. You, no exchanges. Or you can't say, Lord, I'm sorry. I gave you a bad one. I, I want to bring you a better one. He said, you can't go and exchange it at that point in time. It shall be holy. The exchange shall be holy. Now, he said this, he shall at all, if he does change that beast for a beast, then both it and what he exchanged it for become holy. Boy, that stops him from changing them, don't it? Now he's lost both of them at the same time. And that's what he's talking about here because if it's holy, it belongs to God. Look at verse 11. If any be an unclean beast of which they do not offer a sacrifice unto the Lord, then he shall present the beast before the priest, and the priest shall value it, whether it be good or bad. As thou valuest it, so uh, who art the priest, so shall it be. Whatever that priest put a value on, that's what it was. This was not something that you bargained. It was something that was valued. You paid full value for it. Verse 13 and if he will at all redeem it. Now, he leaves an option here for you to redeem it or to buy it back. Say it was a lamb, you could give them the price of a lamb and you could get your lamb back, but you had to add a fifth part under thy estimation. In other words, something costs you $100 and you give it to the Lord and you say, yeah, I want to buy it back. You can buy it back for $120. It's costing you to make these changes if these changes are allowed. And he said this in verse 14, When a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord, then the priest shall estimate it. Now, sometime you just give God your house. Thank God He'd still let you live in it. All right? But you give God your house, all right? Whether it be... Good or bad, as the priest shall estimate it, so shall it stand. But he say, oh, it's a good house or it's a bad house. You're going to give that to the Lord. Verse 15, And if he that sanctified it will redeem his house, he'll add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be his. You can buy it back. Now, if you don't do that, if a man, verse 16, shall sanctify unto the Lord some part of a field of his possession, then thy estimation shall be according to the seed thereof. Now, if you're going to give God a field, you say, Lord, I don't have anything else, then what they're going to do is estimate it by what it grows. What's, what what is, makes a field good to a farmer? Nothing if it's just going to grow up in underbrush. But if he grows something on it, be it barley, be it wheat, be it oats, be it corn, be it soybean, uh, whatever it is. So what he said, he said, you're going to do estimate according to the seed thereof. An omer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. So if it'll bring a omer of barley seed, then they're going to value it at 50 shekels. Verse 17, if he sanctify uh, his field from the year of Jubilee, according to estimation, shall it stand. Now, what they did, if you gave them a house or a piece of land, now the year of Jubilee comes in. What makes it worth more or less? The more years before Jubilee, the more the worth is, but the closer to Jubilee, because it's going to return to its original owner at that point in time. 
That's part of what was a lamb. The 50th year was a year of Jubilee. You had 49 years. So you look and there's 48 years before Jubilee. You give it to God, it's worth a whole lot more because he got it for 48 years. But say you're in the 49th year and next year is a year of Jubilee, it's not worth a whole lot to him. So this in the land changed the estimations because of the year of Jubilee. Now he's going to deal with that. We'll get into it uh, real quick. But he said in verse number 19, And if he that sanctified the field will in any wise redeem it, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be assured to him. So if you gave God your house, but you could buy it back, once again, you bought it back at the price that you were, it was estimated when you gave it to God, but once again, you're adding 20% to it. So if you sold him a house for $100,000, and you say, I want to buy it back, then it'll just cost you $120,000. You say, well, that doesn't sound fair. Hey, you buy a brand new car, pull it off the parking lot, and you're going to lose two to $5,000 on it by the time you get to the first red light, all right? And that's the way business works. You're going to find out God did things in a right way business-wise. He made sure that everything was fair, everything was done right, there was no advantage. Verse number 20 and if he will not redeem the field, or if he have sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed anymore. All right? If he sold that field, it cannot be bought back by anybody at that point in time. But the field, when it goeth out in the jubilee, verse 21, shall be holy unto the Lord as a field devoted. The possession thereof shall be the priest. Uh, it's interesting. Amen. Who's it going to go to? Back to the original owner? priest gets it. <laughs> I wonder how many fields and how many homes a priest ended up with. Look at verse 22. And if a man sanctify unto the Lord a field that he hath bought, which is not of the field of his possessions, he bought something that wasn't originally his. See, you got most things by inheritance. But you get an inheritance, your neighbor moves, what do you try to do if you got the money? You try to buy the land next to you and secure it. Uh, we've got some on Raven Road, across the road and something, and I, hey, uh, if the man sells his piece of property over there, I hope he gives me first shot at buying it. And the reason being that I can control who I look at across the road and who my neighbor is across the road. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 23, Then the priest shall reckon unto him the worth of thy estimation, even unto the year of the jubilee, and he shall give thine estimation in that day as a holy thing unto the Lord. But, verse 24, In the year of the Jubilee, the field shall return unto him of whom it was bought. All right? What's he talking about? All right? I want to buy my neighbor's property. So I buy my pro his property and I, I give this thing to the Lord. In the year of Jubilee, I don't get it back. The neighbor gets it back because it was part of his inheritance. You see what the Jubilee does? It always returns the property back to its original owner in that 50 years. It doesn't go to somebody else. It goes to that original. That way they kept these, uh, you know, you've got 12 tribes. You've got... Uh, you know, part of them on one side of Jordan, part on the other side. It kept everybody's property within that tribe. That way they couldn't sell it out. Judah couldn't buy Dan's property, and then Dan's property continually uh, belonged to him. In the year of Jubilee, it went right back to the tribe of Dan where it was, and that way they kept those 12 tribes, they kept their property safe. Verse 25, And all thy estimation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twenty geras shall be a shekel. He gives twenty geras. Uh, you can use grains or you can use coins uh, in that. It's kind of like our, uh, the uh, uh, new system they tried, to, the metric system. Uh, the advantage of the metric system, we're still on the USA system. You know, we've got inches and feet and yards and 
We've got pints and we've got quarts and half gallons, gallons. Uh, you've got volume, you've got length, you've got weight, and these are all separate. When you get into the uh, decimal system, so to speak, and, and that's what that is, you can actually change weight into volume. That's why mathematically it has a lot of advantages when you go to what's called the metric system. We used a metric system quite a bit in chemistry and different things in college to where you could take weight and you could take volume and you could actually calculate these things together, all right? And see, you can't do that much on, in uh, the USA system. So what it was, he's just saying it, this, this garris, it can be either volume, like if you're bringing grain, or it can be coins if you're bringing silver. And they had a set amount that this shekel was worth. Verse number 26, only the firstlings of the beast, which should be the Lord's firstling, no man shall sanctify it, whether it be ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. Now, the firstborn of everything belonged to God. So you can't give that for a vow. Why? Because you're giving God what's already His. I've often said you, you cannot tithe and, until you get to 10%. All right, you can't say, well, I'm going to tithe 5%. It don't work. That's God's anyway. Huh? But it doesn't count as a tithe. The tithe is 10% of the gross, not 10% of the net. And that's the way the Bible works that thing. But you say, well, I, 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 I tithe this or I tithe that or not. It may or not be. But that 10%, and by the way, if you spend that 10%, it was still God's. That's why he said, Malachi, will a man rob God? All right. Don't want to get into the tithe this morning. But he's talking about if it's a firstling, it belongs to God. You cannot use that for the vow itself. Verse 27, If it be of an unclean beast, then he shall redeem it according to thine estimation. Shall add a fifth part of it thereto. If you're going to buy it back, it costs you 20% more. Or if it be not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to thy estimation. So it remains at the same price until you buy it back. You buy it back, there's 20% more. Verse 28, Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast and of field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but he uh, shall surely be put to death. Now, what he's talking about, he's talking about beast. If you give that thing to the Lord... He said, it's a holy thing. It's the Lord's. It's holy. And that thing, uh, hey, if you, instead of redeeming it, you just put it to death. Now, verse 30 through 34, and we're going to end up with this. All the tithe of the land, whether it be seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. You go back to the Old Testament. What was a tithe? It was the first fruit. That's why they took those as wave offerings to the Lord. When they started to harvest, they'd take the first sheaths of grain, bundles of grain, and they would wave that before God. That belonged to God. They brought that harvest in. That first 10% off the top of that harvest was God's harvest. It belonged to Him. That's what he's talking about here. It's the tithe of that land, it's holy unto the Lord. Verse 31, if a man will at all redeem all of his tithes. In other words, he says, I need that grain. I gave that grain to God. Now what I do, I, I, I need that to feed my family with. I, we've had a drought this year. I gave him grain. I need that grain back. He said, if, if you do that, to redeem that, you've got to add the fifth part unto it. So you got to give back to God not, a, not only the price, the shekels, uh, 50 shekels, but you've got to give Him the 10% on top of that. Now, verse 32, And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod. What they do? They put a rod out, and then they counted them as they go under the rod. 
You know, if you're trying to count uh, cattle, it's easier to do if they're in single file. But if they're not, I mean, a bunch of them, it's easier if you put a rod out there and as soon as they go under that rod, you're counting them. You hold that rod steady. That way you're not recounting cows that you've already counted. It's kind of like you ever got in a hospital room or doctor room, you know, all those little holes they got in these drop down ceilings. You ever tried to count them in one square? You get about as lost as you can be trying to count those things. I've tried to. I've laid on a bed for and looked up there and tried to draw on my mind quadrants and tried to, there ain't no way to do that. It's like counting the stars in the heavens, okay? So he talks about when they pass under the rod. Now, when they pass under that rod, they belong to God. That's how he's counting out what he's going to give to God, that 10%. The tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. That's the tithe. Verse 33, He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. You say, well, I gave good or I gave bad. I want to change that. Once it goes on that rod, it's God's. Once it goes in there, it's God's. When you give a tithe to the Lord, you vow that tithe to the Lord, it belongs to God. At that point in time, it belongs to God. It's His anyway. But he's talking about once it passes on that rod, it's been counted. Once it's been counted, it belongs to the Lord. <clears throat> he shall not change it, good or bad. Then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. You say, well, I'm going to trade. No, you're not going to trade. You're just going to give God another cow. Hmm? These are the rod belong to him. If you want to redeem one back, the one you try to redeem back is still his, but now you have to add what you was going to redeem it with, and you've just simply given another cow is what you've done. Verse 34, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. Now we're going to finish a little bit quicker, but what's he doing? He's setting them up for the land. Now I want to turn just a minute back to verse number 26. He's setting them up. They don't have a whole lot in the desert. God's feeding them with manna. They're going to be there 40 years, but eventually they go into the land with Joshua. They will take that land, and then God's setting up how to vow to them. But I thought this was interesting. You go back to verse number 40. He's talking about all of these uh, whippings that God gave. Got chastisement. Every time God said, I'll add seven to it, I'll add seven to it, I'll add seven to it. Eventually, they went into uh, captivity in Babylon. That was probably around 586 or 587 B.C. You had to, 10 tribes went in, and two years later you had Judah uh, that went in after them in that period of time. He said, if they shall confess their iniquity, in verse number 40, and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they have trespassed against me, that also they have walked contrary to me. If they'll confess, hey, I've walked contrary to God, I've done iniquity, verse 41, that I also have walked contrary unto them. God's chastised them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humble. They were circumcised physically. But what God is interested in is the circumcision of the heart. He talks about that in the New Testament. Their hearts be humbled. Then they accept of the punishment of their iniquity. They said, Lord, we deserved exactly what we got. Look at verse 42. Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, also my covenant with Isaac, also my covenant with Abraham. Now, he's looking back. I've said in the Bible, when you interpret the Bible, you've got to find out real quick, is he looking forward or backwards? It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now he's looking back, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. He's looking back to the fathers instead of looking forward to the fathers. And he talks about them. He said, I will remember the land. Look at verse 43. The land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths. Ha <laughs> ha. Took them into Babylon. The land's resting now. Nobody's planting that land. Boy, hey, that, that land now has been fallow for 70 years. It has recouped itself, all right? 
when you drop leaves and leaves begin to rot and then it turns into loam and boy, some of the richest uh, dirt that you'll ever get comes out of the woods. Boy, you get that black two or three, four inches off the top. You're talking about some soil uh, to grow things in. He talks about them that it'll lie uh, desolate, but it's it's going to be in a, enjoying the Sabbath. They shall accept the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despise my judgments because their souls abhorred my statutes. Look at verse 40 and 45, 46. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God let them go into the land of Babylon for 70 years, and yet God never left them. He never cast them away. They were still His covenant people. Neither, neither will I bore them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will remember for their sakes. He said, for their sakes, I'll remember the covenant that He made with Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt and the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. And these are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel and Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Leviticus. What is Leviticus? Leviticus is how you approach God. That's all it is. It's ceremonial law. Thank God today that Jesus Christ has fulfilled the book of Leviticus. We no longer have to offer and do all these things that you had to do under that law. And I thank God for that. But I thank God for the book of Leviticus. It just shows you that when you approach God, you have to do it, one, in a holy manner. But then you've got to do it in a right manner. God will not accept wrong. Somebody said it's never right to do wrong in order to get a chance to do right. Wrong is still wrong. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you for this Mother's Day. I pray, Father, that you would bless today. Uh, give us a good day, Lord. I'm looking forward to preaching this morning and tonight, uh, just spending time worshiping with God's people. And then, Lord, Again, I ask you to honor these precious ladies. Lord, we love the ladies of this church, how special they are. I don't believe they'll ever uh, fully realize until they get home. But we love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Go on to the prayer rooms.